2020. At least I think that's what day it is. It should load up here shortly. And we'll get everything going. I assume. I assume Chuck and Tim are out there somewhere. Sound is good. I did not order my microphone. I utterly failed to do that. Nor the backdrop to keep the glare out of my eyes. I utterly failed to do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I will endeavor to do that this evening. How's it going, Commander Pete? Hey, Happy. So I'm going to pull a company credit card out, and I'm going to put it here on the desk so that it will remind me <laughs> to order the equipment that I need. <laughs> Thanks for the sub, Epi. Very much appreciated. Hold it up to the camera. Let me put that right up there. <laughs> take a take a, a shot of it. Let me get the back too. Make sure it's all up. I've been watching clips from uh, what is it? Wolf of, Wolf of Wall Street. Is that the name of it? I'm gonna have. I never actually watched that movie. I'm gonna have to sit down and watch that movie. It kind of fascinates. It fascinates me. These guys that uh, I don't know. They um, only steal people's money. <laughs> Whatever the hell it is they do. I don't quite understand it, but I guess they're cold calling in the beginning. That's one of the clips I saw last night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to sit down and watch it because I'm not hundred percent certain how the whole thing unfolds, but I guess that you know, they just cold call clients or potential clients and try to sell them stuff. Uh and the more they can sell, the faster they can sell, they get their commission and they move on. Uh I don't know. It's pretty fascinating. I love Leonardo DiCaprio. He's just a great movie. He was uh, fantastic in Blood Diamond. Uh, really good movie. And uh, just about anything he's done, really. I haven't seen the, um, the... Is it Inception? Is that the the dream the Dreamscape movie? I need to watch. I think that's Inception. No. Something. I don't know. Uh, I was looking at Shutter Island last night. I may dive into that, too. How's it going, Kay Kadora? Kadora. We are here again on a Tuesday afternoon, uh, which is, it was very fortuitous. I was just about to send Codex Egyptium off to the printer. Had a couple of small edits that we were putting in there. I was doing my final pass and discovered that we had left out four images that were key to kind of one part of the book. Um... And uh, so I had to go in there. I put the images in, clean the pages up, but I had to add a page which knocked us off our signature, which meant everything was kind of out of whack. And I was talking to Peter Bradley, who does our layout. Uh, he does the primary layout. I go in and kind of just touch things up and, you know, fix this, fix that, put a few edits in, whatever. But uh, he said, just give it to me and I'll fix it. <laughs> so Peter's. Busy working on that while we're doing this. So the stream came at a perfect time uh, to take me off of that because I was getting kind of cross-eyed trying to, trying to get all that stuff to fit. Uh, but it's in there now. It's really, it's art that Zoe, uh, Zoe Devos did, and it's really fantastic art. And essentially there are two primary pantheons in the Codex Egyptium. There's a whole bunch of gods, but two primary pantheons, one with nine and one with eight. And all eight images were with the one with eight, but only five images were one with, with the one with nine. And I had asked Zoe to do each one individually so that the end user could have, you know, at least imagery for their god. So we had to go and fix that. Uh, though it is all fixed, mostly fixed now. I know Peter fixed the added page, uh, and then he's doing something. I think a piece of art. Apparently Twitch is... My yawning time. <laughs> I just think I spent last last straight yawning mostly. But we are here for Ask Me Anything uh, as we're gearing up into yet another week deep into June now. Uh, any questions that you have about troll of games, about Kickstarters, about things we're doing, things we want to do, things we've done in the past, uh, you know, industry stuff, anything like that, throw it in the feed and I'll do my best to answer it. Um, uh, as we lumber on and through the afternoon. <clears throat> Otherwise, how's it going, DM Samuel? How's it going, Moondog? Otherwise, I'll just dive into whatever whatever mess that we are working on now. Which I am I'm happy to announce the last bit. Hey, Blood Wild, the last bit of 
Amazing Adventures 5E has shipped. It left the building. We took the load up to the truck, or up to the post office today, and dropped them all off. And that was a mountain of foreign, overseas, and non-U.S. based um, shipments. I don't know, about 40 of them. And there's still about 40 people who have not responded to their survey. But beyond that, uh, everything is shipped. So uh, it's good news there. Anything cool coming up? That we should know about any con better. You know, I think all of the conventions are just shut down. Um, Origins is completely out. Gen Con's closed. Uh, Game Hall just announced that they're down as well. The only convention that I know that is that is actually taking place, they voted on it yesterday up in Sturgis, is the big motorcycle rally. They're going to go ahead and have that uh, this year. So uh, maybe we'll head up. Was it Montana? Maybe we'll head up to Sturgis, Montana, and set up a booth and try to try to sell something to the motorcyclists, which would be kind of cool. I really do think that that this the, the logo you see down in the bottom left hand corner, right hand corner, where however it appears, the little dragon with the sword. I think that would be badass on a cut. So <laughs> that would be pretty cool. As for virtual con, you don't have to ask Chuck. He's got us hooked up into a few things. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know offhand. Damn, well, I'm yawning. I don't know offhand uh, where we're set up. I know that we're looking at uh, Gen Con in the UK, uh, getting some some games set up there, and I know we've talked to Reaper Con. So uh, hopefully something will. Uh, we'll get we'll get more information on that as we stumble forward. But what I really like to do is get my carcass up and on Discord, and we'll try to do that next week and start running a small game, kind of a contained game, uh, six to eight people. We're going to have some kind of prerequisites. You have to be on Discord. You have to have a camera, you know, a couple of things like that. But, um, you know, here you go. Make Trollcom happen. But we're going to try to set it up. So we're going to run like a three-hour game uh, during the week next week. Uh, and get that get that rolling. Minimally, if we can get me up online, uh, get some more trolls up online, then we start. That really becomes the nascent, you know, the the egg that will become troll con again. I think we did five or six of those back in the day. Uh, I don't. Oh, are we being rated? Oh, very cool. Twenty Titan TV is rating it. Thanks for the raid, man. That's very cool. <laughs> I just noticed that. <laughs> My extraordinarily. Uh, slow moving brain, uh, but we did the last Trollcon we did is Trollcon 10, but they just didn't want to name them sequentially, so I, I, it wasn't actually the 10th Trollcon. I think it was the fifth, maybe the sixth Trollcon that we were doing. Um, so I, I don't know how many there were in the past. There, there were a number of them, but there will be some more in the future. And I keep wanting to do the virtual. It just keeps falling out of my. Uh, it, it falls out of my roster. We've got. Man, I, the backlog is just now beginning to break apart. But so we finished shipping Amazing Adventures. Now we've got to we got to get the website brought up to speed and get that up. There I go again. Get that up and going. I need to get some juice. All right, guys. I'm gonna knock over. Uh, we got to get the website updated with all the Amazing Adventures titles, and that's like 12 of them. And then we've got. Uh, Codex Egyptium, which I was hoping to send to the printers today, but that's going to be tomorrow now. Uh, that has to be, well, that'll definitely be finished. And then Codex uh, Keltarum, I've got to take some time and sit down and go over the final text on that as well. Uh, it's going to take the better part of a, a day because it's almost a 300 page book. Uh, but get that thing off of the printers. Really, by Friday, I want Keltarum and and Egyptium at the printers, uh, giving me full range of ships onto Memorial Tomb and uh, onto Gaxmore. Gaxmore being the primary focus uh, of those two. Gaxmore, you know, she's laid out and she's mostly done, but the backer submissions and the industry professional submissions are kind of a cantankerous mess, and it's going to take a little bit of finagling to make sure the math lines up with the text, and it's all very usable. Uh, Peter and I sent back and forth 700 gajillion Skype messages fixing just one page in Gaxmore. It's <laughs> on forever. I kept finding stuff I needed in the change, uh, and he's not quite ready to give the, the book over to me because he knows I'll start mucking with it. Um, 
got rid of that space without needing our excellent. So he's just sort of the rearranging I did. I just got a Skype from him saying he fixed it. It's good to go. And, and now he's flexing his uh, design muscles. He's actually extraordinarily good at layout, and he's extraordinarily fast, and he knows all the kind of tricks to uh, to tangle it. And he's uh, that Codex Egyptium. He has outdone himself. The book looked looked absolutely beautiful. I didn't even know there was a gray hot cog. Well, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's my, uh, what was my mom telling me that if she, when she was young, so she's 78 now, so she was young in the 40s, and my mom was telling me that um, if she said, gosh darn, she got her mouth washed out with soap because her parents knew what that was a euphemism for or what, what they were actually saying. So <laughs> even saying mucking would a, uh, would would get us in trouble just a few years ago. And I don't know if you've ever had your mouth washed out with soap. I have. It is not pleasant. Um, basically, a bar of soap and a toothbrush, and, and you're, you're <laughs> just not good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, knows, he knows the story. Yeah, you know, in the old days, we, we, got, we got a little bit um, a little bit more punished. I don't think I really got under my kids cussing much. The boys are completely sexist when it comes to cussing. The girl could cuss. Any of them could cuss. They don't care, but they couldn't cuss around elderly people, women, or children. So it kind of restricted it to this zone <laughs> where they were allowed to cuss. Um, but they, they're pretty good. They, they control it. So I, I, I never washed anyone's mouth out with soap. We also did the nickel jar, of course. Um, Every time we cut, the nickel jar got filled up. But it was mostly my dad dropping coins in there. So he, he, he made the nickel jar go away. He's tired of messing with it. I think that over the, the laundry machine forever. Oh, that dog never good. All right. For those of us just joined, for those of you just joining, uh, this is uh, Ask Me Anything with Troll Lord Games. Uh, I'm Stephen Schnault, CEO and General Manager of Troll Lord. Uh, we, of course, publish mountains of role-playing games, uh, primarily Castles and Crusades, but Amazing Adventures. And now we've got a 5th edition line, and we've got an Amazing Adventures 5th edition line, and we've got, of course, Victorious and Tainted Lands, and we're revitalizing a few others like Star Siege and whatnot. So lots of RPG material here, World of Air, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, if you're new, uh, please give us a follow. Sure, appreciate it. Uh, any amount of support you can, you can send our way is, is most welcome. Spread the news, too. Let everybody know, but uh, ask you any questions that you have. I've been doing this for about 20 years, maybe over 20 years now. Wow. Right at 20 years. We would have started in 1999. Oh, 21 years. <laughs> yeah, so 21 years I've been doing this. Um, so I've got a, a little bit of experience. Any questions you have, just hurl out into the ether here. Otherwise, I will just meander on talking about movies and comic books and books and whatever whatever else is, has interested me uh, or is interesting me at the moment. Let's see, what are we doing here? Uh, yeah, so just real quick, we've got a Patreon account for the Gym Tricks to Trade and the World Anvil. World Anvil, we have a world of aired up and online. Check all that stuff out. All over the, go to our webpage at www.com. Well, hell, it's all right there. It's right there in the feed. All right, check all that stuff out. But, um, so anyways, so we're going to, we're going to wrap up Keltarum and and Egyptian this week. There, there'll be a done deal. They're already done. It just needs its fine tuning. My guess is when I'm done here, Peter will have already uploaded the file and I'll have it saved and get back into, into the final kind of pass through on that. First thing in the morning, I'll upload that to uh, Walworth Printing and to get the cover laid out, get that uploaded as well and get Egyptian put to bed, which will be wonderful. Uh, and then um, I'll, I'll dive into Keltarm by tomorrow afternoon. We need some, uh, what are we, are there any horror adventures in the world? You know, it's funny, Eddie, um, there are not. And Davis has done one, uh, two maybe, The Hanged Man. I think that's the one. So he did one. Um, but what I really want to do, I've been running this game recently. Chuck's actually sitting in on it. Um, that horror base I took to the movie Gretel and Hansel and the Witch as a major inspiration to kind of bundle it into Planescape stuff that I'm working on, uh, the avatars that I'm working on for the of Gods and Monsters. 
bundle it all together and made this, and fairy tales, I should throw that in there too, and made this horror-esque adventure. And I've never run a horror adventure, but it's going really well, I think. No one has any idea what's going on. Uh, lots of strange things happening here and there, children and nursery rhymes and, uh, you know, odd, just odd stuff. Um, so I, I really think I want to write this one up and put, put this out. Uh, it involves uh, all kinds of Aryan mythology and, uh, and horror stuff. But we definitely we need more horror and we need more dungeons, to be honest with you. Um, I think we've got one honest to God dungeon for all. Yeah, I've said this a thousand times. Everybody knows it. I'm not a huge fan of dungeons. I don't run them often. So when I'm looking for when I'm looking at the publication schedule, I don't ever really consider dungeons as part of it. And I don't know why. Game Dungeons and Dragons should <laughs> you know should come, you know at least make me think of dungeons, but I just don't. Uh, but we need just a more simple dungeon crawl. Twenty rooms, you know, something like that. But uh, we'll work on that eventually. Uh, Greyblade seventy eight. Hey Stephen. Uh, first, hello Greyblade. How's it going? I'm going to run some CNC for some newbies in two weeks. Can I say a few words to to them in preparation for it? And what advice would you give to CNC newbies? So you know the how's it going, Phelps? So the, the funny thing about castles and crusades, and this is what I would I would tell them that. Um, it, it's a game that's so crazy similar to Dungeons & Dragons, it's like putting on a pair of old boots. Except, uh, there's a certain level of, there's a certain, I don't, know, I don't know how to describe it, there's kind of a plateau you've got to reach, an understanding you've got to reach, and it takes a few games to do it. Castles and Crusades is not restricted. I was actually, in this game that I was just talking about, um, this horror game that I'm running, uh, and there's lots of questions and lots of what's going on and how this is, why is, and this is, and that doesn't make sense, and this isn't, and and I got to thinking those questions, a lot of those questions are kind of geared for Dungeons and Dragons because Dungeons and Dragons and uh, Swords and Wizards and all these other games, a lot of them they have rules for things. Castles and Crusades doesn't. Castles and Crusades basically has the siege engine, and that is an attribute check system that allows the CK to do. Uh, or, or to create, you know, a level playing field upon which everybody can play. The players, this is what I would tell your players, uh, it ta it's a learning curve, and I'm serious. It is a learning curve to go from these fantastic games like D&D &D and Dungeon Crawl Classics, all their great, fantastic games, but to go to Castles and Crusades, there's a bit of a learning curve in that you have to retool your brain into understanding that you can try almost anything. You don't have to have a skill. You don't have to have a feat. You don't have to have something listed anywhere. You can try it. And the only caveat being if it is another class's skill, you really can't do that. So your CK may allow you. So there's no reason to not try. I mean, we have everybody listening at the door. I don't have people at the, at the party go, can I look for tracks? They're not rangers, so no, they can't. But can they? Sure, they can look for tracks. I, I can't track for anything, but I can go outside and look for tracks. Chances of me finding them, slim to none. Just slim to none, but uh, I, I can certainly do it. So CNC is a bit of a learning curve, so I would tell your players, don't, don't let rules constrain you. You know, uh, reject the tyranny of rules and just use your imagination and go and just try everything. And what's nice about it is the CK, that'll learn, help the CK really learn how to use the siege engine because on the CK side, it takes a little bit of getting used to when they start asking questions that aren't anywhere in any book, and you've got to come up with what attribute to check, and then you got to get it at, at you know a talent level pretty quick. Uh, did we make a chart somewhere? We maybe even made a chart somewhere that kind of set standards, but I don't I don't know if we ever published that. I, I know we've had a lot of requests for it that we, we kind of make a chart so that TK could kind of know if it's, if it's really difficult. It's the L twelve. If it's really and I think I nixed that. That might be in the CKG, but I vaguely remember nixing it because I didn't want I didn't want any castle keepers constrained by a rule that they may not agree with uh, in that regard. You may want it to be X, and, and if TLG said it should be Y, I don't want you guys constrained that way. So I think I, I think I kicked that out. I think I got kicked to the curb. But that's what I would say. I would say uh, settle in and. Let your imagination run wild because you can try anything and absolutely try anything. Wear that D20 out and wear the CK out uh, with, with everything. And what's cool about it is you can start 
and because of that, you start building background that, you know, maybe this character grew up in near the, the sea and can swim really well or, you know, any kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff will come out of that season and once you embrace it. It takes a few games. Um, but once you once you grab the hold of it, uh, it's something else. So that I, I hope that I hope that gave you a little bit of decent advice. That's the third party of my group love. Yeah, we got I, Effie. We've got to fix that dungeon thing. Uh, I think that if the dungeons were done shorter, you know, 15 rooms, maybe 20 rooms, that would be far more palatable. I love that word, but I can't ever say it. Palatable, palatable, <laughs> whatever that word is. Uh, I, I would like that a little bit better because uh, you can get in and out of them. And the problem with dungeons is if they grind on too long, they get a little boring, uh, and it's hard to get out of it. So shorter room is better off there. I'm fascinated with that as usual. I have to go and King Kothar. Trolls are made, ruins of Undo area. There you go. Lots of, uh, there we go, lots of dungeon names right there. <laughs> yeah, it's it, that's the thing. It, well, that's part of it. Now, that's something that's easily forget Epi. So Epi says, I wouldn't say it's a learning curve, more of a realizing not everything needs a die roll. Now, that's actually two things. Um, so one thing to keep in mind in Castles is that you don't have to roll for everything. If, and, and I forget this all the time. I am the absolute worst about remembering this because uh, I'll just tell them to make an attribute check and while I'm, I'm CKing in my brain, I'm going, well, they, they know how to do that. They shouldn't be making a check, but I've already said it. So they got to make a check, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but one, that, that's definitely something, if you spot on, that's definitely something about CNC. Not everything's going to require a check. Uh, but I'm really talking about, and, and this is, it took me a little while, that almost anything goes, and you can try anything, because all you got to do is make an attribute check. And it's hard to kind of think. It's hard for players, and I see it all the time at conventions. People who have never played CNC or any kind of, you know, free-form game like this, and I shouldn't say free-form, that's best. That gives us a bad connotation for this type of game. There's structure to it. But I've seen innumerable people who come to the table, you know, my big games that I run at, at Gary Kine, Game Hole, and Gen Con, and wherever I go. Uh, they they don't really get it. They'll they'll kind of hesitantly say, well, can I try to climb on the rock? Absolutely. Can I try to see where they're... Absolutely. You know, whatever. Uh, and it just takes a little bit of, you know, now once you start doing it, and once they start doing it, uh, it's fast. They start picking it up real quick because they figure, oh, wait a minute, I can do you know, damn near anything, and then they roll with it. Uh, so it's a good thing. I see Commander Pete. Uh, yeah, I'm playing a game at the moment, and we're struggling a bit with trying to move quietly. Well, that's really a rogue skill, so we tend to move cautiously, but that not, but then stop way back and let the professional go in and actually close, scout and close. And that's actually the way it would be. I mean, you, go, you take somebody, I don't know, you take... Well, let's use some Native Americans. I know that a lot of um, uh, U.S. Cavalry used Native Americans to fight Native Americans, and they would certainly send them forward because these guys were, and mountain men, these guys had learned how to move through the forest without being seen and heard and to understand smells and to understand all these things. But you take me out in the woods, eh. <laughs> God knows what I'm going to do. So, yeah, leave it to the professional. But there's other things that you can do. You know, you can uh, put cloth over your boots. You can discard the heavy armor, leave the shield behind, whatever. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do that can improve your chances of actually moving forward a little bit quietly, but you'll never be quite like the road. Um, good deal, Grand Blade. I'm glad. <laughs> I, I never know if my babble is helpful or, or wrong. So. <laughs> Digestible. <There's, laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. Much better than palatable. Pal <laughs> I don't know why I cannot say that word. Palatable. Wow. <laughs> Uh, great work, players. Look at the rules, what they can do. It's just, you get, yeah, that's it, Ultra Magnus. It's, that's a good way of putting it, too, because um, when you've got a rule book in front of you and you've got your character class, it's got... We had this long debate two weeks ago about 5e stat blocks and what should be included in them. Uh, and there's so many things that you know are germ to your character that germ to your character that um, you really kind of need them. And without them, you, you, you don't know what you're doing. So... You get, as a player, you get used to looking at that. Okay, this is what I can do. Here's my list of skills. This is what I can do. Well, see, and see, that's not the case. It's what the dice are going to allow you to do. And the CK. I mean, obviously, the CK is going to put a heavy or a light, whatever. He's going to put a challenge level on there, uh, and it's either going to work or not. So. <laughs> have at it. Have at it, Commander Pete. 
We need dungeons for certainty. It's the old school idea that once you roll the die, you have already messed up. You're in real trouble now. Just let the CK want to, know. <laughs> want, want to do it, and you need to do it without a dice roll. That it's a funny thing because uh, I am, I am forever forgetting that part of CK, and I don't know why. And I think it's because I, part of it, and I've talked about this in GM Trick or Trade. I really like, I, I I like to make players roll dice because it's a way to engage them. And almost any time that you're rolling. Uh, as a player, you want to pay attention. So let's take this game that I'm running. Now, there was a lot of descriptive text and just a lot of weird stuff. And there were these two little children at one point, and one was humming a nursery rhyme, and one kept asking for candy. And they didn't know what. They're in this kind of uh, ethereal dimension thing. They don't know where they are. So the children are misplaced. Everything's misplaced about it. And the two children are chained together. But um, so they, they didn't really know... You, you know, what was going on, and it was just, I don't know, question after question after question, trying to unravel the mystery of this thing, and that's where this, the whole scene is, and all this stuff, just, it kicks in, it kicks in beautifully when you're, when you're looking at this stuff, but I got to also remember to not make them roll dice, and I just, because, you know, half of the players would be sitting there, you know, like, Todd gets very frustrated very quickly, so when all the descriptive text and everything that we're doing, uh, He's a little bored. He doesn't know what's going on. But if I have him rolling dice, then he's rolling, you know, he's at least engaged in some capacity. Uh, and that's that's kind of what I was getting at when I rambled off there for a second. But uh, I have them roll dice too often. <laughs> too often because they're 15th level. A lot of this stuff should be just second nature. I mean, 15th level is pretty damn high up there. Less rooms, more traps. There you go. <laughs> you know, Blood Wild, every room is a trap. That's what Blood Wild just said. So... I don't know what dungeon, it was a little one that I was working on. I don't know what dungeon it was, but um, it was inside a bigger adventure that I'd done, and Mark said that, I, oh, it was Alstrak, actually. It was the first office of Alstrak, which is just all dungeon. And uh, Mark, he, he was still working full-time at the time, and he said, hey, dude, you got to put something, he was reading it over, he said, you got to put something in every room. Every room has to have something interesting. I was like, oh, my God, it's like... 700 rooms, I can't put something in. Some rooms are just empty. There's just nothing in it. <laughs> now I'll just put a trap in all the rooms. <laughs> there you go. Oh, yeah, Grim Dude's ultimate trap. That'd do it. Let's see. Modern gamers are acclimat acclimated. Man, I'm, just, I'm dying here. Acclimated to a certain experience. One with mild crunch, lots of die rolling, and an expectation that they are the protagonist, the hero, and the eventual main character, regardless of the absurdity or, or anti heroes of their character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, King Cobra, the funniest thing about it is Davis has said, Davis, for those who don't know, is my brother, co-founder of Total Games, co-creator of Captain Chase, uh, creator of the World of Invaders. He has said for years that this basic game, RPG, the basic concept behind it is to kill things and take what they own. Kill loot is what he calls it. So, <laughs> so, which is saying that the heroes don't normally do that. Captain America doesn't normally loot the dead. And then maybe he does occasionally. I don't know. I haven't read all the comics, but I have a really hard time finding players who who have an appetite for any sort of game that isn't that. I understand it's a matter of culture, but it but it disheartens me that nobody my age is engaging in OSR, even semi grounded, grim gaming. Yeah, I I can feel you. My table's pretty. We're pretty grounded. Um, I mean, they consider themselves the heroes, but sort of. Uh, there's all kinds of. <laughs> they, they're aware at a certain level, but you're right. I mean, it's, uh, it's, and I shouldn't say it's, I don't know if it's tough or not. I, I don't, you know, when I run my big games at conventions and whatnot, I get a plethora of different players in there, and they seem to adapt to the game pretty quickly. As that said, my games are not, at the conventions, they're not that grim. They're pretty open and fun, and I don't mean fun as in grim is not fun, but I mean everybody's laughing and cracking jokes and whatnot because there's 24 people at the table. Uh, and it's hard to do otherwise, and there's always two or three knuckleheads doing crazy stuff. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know if the modern gamer is stuck in that rut. Meaning to say, so if you found them and actually found a bunch of gamers and actually sat down and played three or four games, would they adjust quickly into into a more grim style? I don't know. I mean, it's possible... Uh, it probably depends on the table. I think that I think that if you can engage people along that line with 
uh, having the character somehow involved, uh, break into some moral ambiguities, and not just focus on treasure. And I think that's a problem with like, and I can't I, I can't say this for sure on Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, but I suspect it's the case that it's goal oriented, as in we got to get the treasure, we got to beat this monster to get this. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the culture behind it. And that's what video games are, right? I mean, uh, you really are playing a video game to achieve whatever, to unlock something, a weapon or, a, you know, wealth or a car or whatever it is that you're doing. And the game that you're talking about at Kothar is different. I mean, it's very different. And it's a, a game that I prefer to play, and I know that at least half of my table prefers to play. It's not that kind of goal. Or that's the treasure is kind of a you know a side note to what you're it's just a um that's a, just a, an added bonus to the the story that's unfolding and they chose like the story that they're on now i don't i won't go into a lot of aired stuff but in the world of air there's a concept called the gonfod uh, and the gonfod is the end of day this is uh the gonfod is going to begin when the god orndul returns from the wretched plains in the homeless and they got it in their head. They started worshiping Amanut, which is one of the old gods, uh, but Amanut is greatly reduced in power. And they decided around the fifth level or sixth level, and it was Davis and Mac that drove this, they decided that they want Amanut, their patron god, to be strong again. How to do that, which in, that is to get rid of the judgment of Forthane, because the judgment of Forthane is what kept Orin Duel destroyed or down. So let's get rid of. Their, their objective wasn't to do the Gonfod, but their objective was to bring back, to break the judgment of Corthane. Uh, and the only way to do that is to bring back Orndul. The judgment of Corthane in the world of Eric, I'm telling this all back. The judgment of Corthane uh, was the, the greatest of the gods. Corthane created the judgment in which he restricted God's ability to interact with you. Uh, and the only one that can contest that is Orndul. Orndul was defeated and imprisoned in the homeless house. So their quest has become to create, to make their god strong again, to bring back Orndul so that he can fight Corthane. Now when you boil the fat off, Orndul is an evil god, Corthane is a good god. And it's clearly stated in the Codex. Now, if you read the World of Aaron, Corthane is kind of an ass. He's like a lawful good, he's the lawful good paladin you don't want. Um, and uh, Orndul is clearly evil, but he's, there's a lot of chaos involved with it, so some, some measure of freedom comes with that. Uh, so they easily kind of married up with bringing back of this ancient deity who has the connotation for moral destruction so that they can bring power back to Amanut. So the moral ambiguities in the game are huge. I mean, there was quite a few debates as to whether they should be doing it uh, and all that stuff. And that makes for a, a, an epic story that's unfolding in which treasure is really just something, it's just a tool that helps you get towards your end game, which is to bring Orndul back in this case. So I agree. I mean, I think that if you can find a group like that, it's much more enjoyable. It has much more depth to the game, and there's more story to it. And when there's more story to it, uh, the players want to get into it more. They get more involved into it. Even those who are generally reluctant to do it, you know, to role play and whatnot, tend to get kind of caught up into it. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah, I've seen it. Maybe grim is the wrong word. And it may be, but I know what you mean by it. It's kind of gritty, uh, I hate the word realistic in a role-playing game, <laughs> but realistic in that uh, grim kind of has a connotation to it, but I, 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 you're definitely, your point is still very, very bad. Is, is, is there a more powerful character hero? Is probably the wrong word. Yeah, hero really should be tossed down as well, uh, especially in role-playing games. Uh, my character never, let's see, my characters never start out as major heroes. They are more confident than a commoner, but not that much more, and they certainly aren't heroes in the, in the power sense. And they really shouldn't be at first level. First through fifth, sixth level, probably. You're just a dude. I look at with my current group, it makes of old school too completely new to RPGs. And another with a 5e D and D player, they may have uh, they have my mindset. Mostly restrictions are good as an alignment. Granted, have I've never played anything past A D and D to E, though like even adding things the elements. Yeah, it's good. If that's the thing, if you can find that group, I think people grow into the style. If you can make your table, you know, I don't know, engaging. And that's not easy to do when you've got to... I can do it because I've been gaming with the same people since the mid-80s. Right? We broke up for a short period while I was in the, the Army, but beyond that, and they kept gaming. 
So we and somehow we all ended up back in Little Rock. So I'm very spoiled, completely and utterly spoiled. I mean, I uh, I've gamed with these guys forever, uh, and we all game alike. So it's easy for us to keep each other in games. Our players who ain't modern D and D players to start with would be a better bet. Yeah, I don't know, Grey Blade. I, I think you're right, but I think that if you can get if you can get some of these new people into it. Um, and we're already there. We're seeing 5e sales across the board. It's not just TLG, but every publisher across the board is seeing 5e sales decline. And the reason this is, people are getting kind of tired of it and looking for something new. So now is really the time to introduce them to the game that you want to play, whether it's CNC or whatever, Dungeon Crawl Classics or Sword and Wizardry or whatever. Um, now, you bring that to them, call it Cthulhu, and I think you might find a more receptive audience because people are getting a little bit, uh, they're kind of bored with it. Um, all right, maybe Grimm is the wrong word. Most of my local friends play mini games, and every time I hear about them, it's an absurd degree of Avengers level superheroes. Yes, 15th Queen's level, staying guys, slaying guys, and armies for breakfast, flying around on superheroes, <laughs> 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 and occasionally exchanging quippy or melodramatic dialogue. It's so fundamentally different from the sort of games I enjoy moral ambiguity, being the underdog, <laughs> forging your own path. Toward your own goals. Oh, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about, King Talker. It baffles the living crap out of me. I know people play that way, and it's great. If you enjoy it, that's fantastic. I mean, God bless you, but it's not the way I play. So when I'm, when I'm listening to people, I'm always a little bit, I'm a little bit <laughs> taken aback by it. It's kind of funny. I, I, and that's one reason that air is the way it is, because it isn't that. Uh, I sit them down to play something more my speed of them, and they play for two sessions. And they're oh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, um, oh, maybe yeah, get some kind of hook, I guess, uh, a long stream hook to get them in there. But maybe not. Uh, it's 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 hard to say. Hopefully, you can find the right group or your friends give it another shot and stick it with an account. Yeah, I don't know. Some kind of some kind of thread. Uh, I, I don't know. And one of the things that that I try to do when you start something new, and I know I've talked about this gym trick or trade, is don't give them much. Don't even don't even let them know what kind of game it's going to be. Do something very focused, very simple. Find the orcs, steal the treasure. Do that for two or three games to just kind of get everybody's feet wet. But then on game three or four, just mention backstory. You know, one of the things I did, I've talked about this before, did that very thing, just a bunch of nonsensical adventures. But I started to mention the green wizard control of the southern part of the woods. And it was my intent that this was going to be a 10th level encounter. Uh, and over time, the Green River just became this huge, you know, uh, monster in the background that they, they knew they couldn't take, but they eventually had to. And it helped me weave the story together. So you might try something like that. But it's tough. I mean, it's tough to get, it's tough to get people to game like you do. Uh, because you have, especially if you have to train them, because, man, it can be, <laughs> it can be 10 games. And you're like, ah, pulling your hair out. I'd say playing in a 5e game right now, it has some cool feeling like, oh, but I don't know, it lacks some of those two things. Yeah, that, uh, Grey Blade, that's what I hear about 5e, that kind of concept on 5e all the time. It's a great game, uh, but it's it's just, it's like a video game. And video games are cool for about 60 hours of play or 30 hours of play, and then yeah, you're kind of done. Uh, I remember when my son got GTA 5, he played it, I think he stayed up for 60 hours, and he never played it again. Uh, because he had kind of done everything, and that's where, that's where those games, and this is what we're seeing, what we're seeing is fatigue in sales in D&D, because people are, are feeling exactly what you are, the Great Lake uh, and his co are, is they're getting a little fatigued from it, because it's just not that, that's interesting, and they'll go back to it occasionally, um, but, uh, and, and this is really where, from a publisher standpoint, uh, the story, the elements, the, just one, encouraging people out of use their imaginations and, and push beyond that. Uh, and then just giving them lots of fuel for that is our kind of approach, TLG's kind of approach to this, this discussion. Uh, we've got tons of adventures, but they're all kind of, you know, loosely, anyone who's picked up any of our stuff, very little of it is, I can think of one that's self-contained. Most of them just kind of explode, and you play this part of the adventure, but there's other stuff that you could be doing. You could play in Mortality of Green for weeks before you ever actually got involved with the, the thingamabob. Uh, that ogre or troll, whatever, in the southern part of the woods. So that's kind of our approach to it. Uh, and maybe you just, you gotta, I don't know, that's tough. There's no texture or grit, that's a great way of putting it. 
It all explained itself. <laughs> oh, man. That is a great way. I, 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 you know, I, I'm not going to talk bad about D&D, &D, but that's, <laughs> that's a fantastic way of putting it. He liked this stuff. The best games I played as a kid were games that I didn't know type of game, so what seemed sci-fi turned out to be sci-fi. Oh, yeah, those things are bad. I said, that was my introduction to Dungeons & Dragons. I didn't know what that, that was going on. Davis was just saying stuff, and he made me a character, and he gave me the he said, name, and it was a fighter. I named him Tarzan, and I went into it, uh, and then this stuff was happening. I can remember killing my first orc to this day. I mean, it was it was crazy. Uh, then it's like, it's like man, That also reminds me of the first time I watched the film Dusk Till Dawn. I had no idea what the film was all about. Uh, was about at all when I sat down to watch it, and it was perfect the way it flipped from a regular kind of film to all that. <laughs> it really did that well. If you, I, I was actually getting disgusted with the, I don't like serial killers. I don't like the concept. I don't like the idea of these people. I don't like it glorified, any of that stuff. And the two knuckle dusters are just murderers. Um, so I was getting kind of disgusted with the movie, and then it, <laughs> it flipped on a dime when. When Selma Hayek comes down, she's got snakes, she turns into a vampire or whatever it is. Uh, crazy stuff. I had a friend who wouldn't play anything except Beyond the Supernatural, my first experience. That's interesting. It's cool on pick up, and then 20 hours later, you die. <clears throat> yeah, you definitely want, yeah, CNC's way to go. 5 e offers almost every single character type and ability to use magic, so the magic is at maximum. That's, that, I've heard that's not good. And 4E did the healing ridiculous. Uh, I'm going to ask you to speculate. 5E is in that, the, the Laggard phase, laggard, laggard phase of market saturation sales is beginning to wane. What's the next big, best big thing? Well, we're already hearing, and we're hearing lots of stuff uh, on the grapevine about sixth edition. There's been some shakeups over there with personnel for a variety of reasons. I don't know. I I follow it a little bit, but um, so uh, sixth edition is probably going to be their their thing. But uh, you know, it's hard to say the. There's nothing that I see now. Of course, the news channels are all inter interrupted because of the pandemic. Most of the information that we pick up, you know, what's going on in the industry, we, we pick up at conventions. And we're sitting late night talking to other publishers. We're talking to this person. We're talking to that person. But uh, I'm not seeing anything on the horizon. We saw, like, think Star Wars license came up for renewal and wasn't renewed. There's some oddities like that. Uh, and I don't have any clue what they're going to do with 6th edition. I know they're going to do it. I, mean, I haven't heard that from Wizards of the Coast, but as a publisher, I can almost guarantee you there will be a 6th edition uh, within the next probably couple of years. I don't know what they're going to change or how they're going to do it, but uh, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I will say this, uh, and I don't, I do not think it will be the next big thing. Chuck. Chuck thinks it will, but Castle of the Sage has been selling like gangbusters. Recent gangbusters. We've been doing really well. Uh, it's just rolling out, which is very, very nice. Um, but it's not, we really need Dungeons and Dragons on the playing field as the big, as the big 800 pounds. We realize that they carry the weight uh, to drag bookstores and, um, or to keep bookstores and hobby stores in the RPG market. Without Dungeons and Dragons, it becomes kind of risky for. Uh, shops to keep their shelves lined with all kinds of third party or second party publishers. So we'll see. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, I think the edition's got a, a little bit of lifespan to it. Uh, but if you notice, already a year ago, we were all talking about all the celebrities that played D&D. &D. That was the news every day. It was celebrity, celebrity, celebrity. And now it's hardly anything. You know, it, it, it's passed. Uh, it's moved on. The edition has kind of moved into its next cycle. We'll see how it. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, <laughs> uh, P H A S Y, is that right? Uh, I can't spell for shit. But um, yeah, we'll see. I don't know. It's interesting. I think the market is now, and this is this is big picture. I think the economy is in such a state of flux from China, you know, and supply chain to mom-pop stores closing. We still don't have a good idea of how many mom-pop stores are closed. I was a little surprised. Uh, our distribution sales in what is it, our distribution sales in May were much stronger than I thought they would be. Uh, I thought we were going to get hammered on the distributor end just because of store closings and force all of this stuff, but uh, that didn't seem to happen. That caught me a little bit, you know, pleasantly surprised, but I was surprised by that. 
Um, but um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going to be the next big thing. I, I think we're going to be into we're going to slide. But this is what I don't think is going to happen. I don't think there's going to be a big thing. I think we're going to slide into a period like we did with fourth edition, not nearly as bad as fourth edition. I think the economy is going to get bumpy, and then uh, Dungeons and Dragons is going to continue to kind of to wane a little bit uh, until they get kind of sea legs on that on either the sixth edition or find something new to kind of revitalize the market. Uh, and the rest of us are going to slog through it like we always do. Goodman games, Frontline games, Troller games. Uh, you know, during recessions, things like games usually do well. I know that from the, I mean, all, all small publishers are doing pretty good. Uh, I, the bigger ones are getting a little bit harder hit simply because they they couldn't prepare for it as easily, nor could they, nor did they. Um, I, I'm still amazed at how many companies were caught flat footed with what was coming. We, as soon as that virus jumped into South Korea, you, <laughs> you should have known something was not good coming out of all this. Uh, I have a homebrew world with low magic use, but players of 5D want to have all the power of magic. Yeah, I can't stand that, DM, but that stuff. I really, magic needs to be curtailed. It needs to be special. It needs to be magic. It needs to be magical is what it needs to be. Uh, and when you start getting up at the high levels, uh, magic becomes such a huge thing on the, the table. If everybody's doing it, the one that bogs the game down, takes the special nature away from it, and you become so insanely powerful. Uh, we played an AD&D game forever, and by the end of it, they were 20-something level, 25th level, I don't know, but... The Paladin and the Ranger were casting spells, the Wizard was casting spells, the Cleric was casting spells, and the Monk had become a dual-class Monk Cleric. So there were so many, I can't remember what it was, but like 200 spells a day could be cast. It just became utterly ridiculous. So magic has to be, it absolutely has to be controlled. Um, I mean, everyone knows it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Hi, everyone, just a reminder that we'll love it. If you play that, that's, that's responding. Game, if they do proper drag, which they won't, maybe 60 would be interesting. Man, if they would do Greyhawk, it would be cool. Um, I, I would love to see Greyhawk back. It, it's, it's a fantastic setting. I mean, I, I thought it was much better than any other setting out there. It was fun. It was imaginative. It was contained. It was, I don't know, and it gave so much room for the DM to grow and expand their own game. I mean, there was just a little bit of information given, and then you could go. There wasn't 400 volumes of crap on it. Um, it's just good stuff. It's actually what inspired air when you get into air. I, I try to cap the information so that the DM, the CK, can take that and go. Just go. It's your own game. Once you buy it, it's yours. Yeah, I, 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 I heard something about Greyhawk a few months ago. I'd have to look it up. It, it was floating around somewhere, but I don't think they were open. I can't remember what it was. I don't play the group with that. Man, yeah, Monty Hall. People want to play books they can sit at home with. Yep. See, Fabi doesn't have an, exp an expectation of having lots of magic. I was like, three, three did. So that a plus three armor weapon is rare. But every class has way to cast. Yeah, that's not, that's not quite to my taste. I know some people love it, and that's fantastic, but not quite to my taste. That is the overload of, that is the overload of magic I'm talking about. Everyone can cast spells. Based off, given their history and continuous success with MTG, I could totally imagine 60 being more game-breaking nonsense metagaming. Yeah, I'm just... Yeah, based off, you might be right. I don't know what they're going to do with it. They, This is what I, I, I suspected when they released the edition, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to be ugly or anything, but th there's a, a heavy echo of the Siege engine in 5th edition, which is great. That's fantastic. Um, but I never really feared D&D &D knocking Troll Lord or CMC off. It may, who knows, but simply because... My philosophy was Wizards of the Coast are going to take this germ of a concept and they're going to keep adding stuff to it until it is so heavily weighed down with rules and other stuff that it's going to be impossible to play. And if, as those of you who have been around CNC for, for a while know, we released it in 04 and 05 and the game is the same. We haven't changed anything. You can get, you can pick up a first edition player's handbook and start playing with a seventh edition player's handbook and the only difference is you're going to find it a month in the barbarian. And the monk is just main changes. The barbarian, the barbarian actually changes it. The rules stay. So I, I suspect makes off that you're right. I find it difficult to discuss 5e because I have never read the books. See, I haven't played, so I don't, I've just kind of heard things, and I really, I, and I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm disparaging the game. It's a different game than CMC. I know this because I, some of the players at my table also play 5e, five, five e, and I can see how they respond at my table because they're 5e players. They're so used to, to to things being 
written down for them that it's difficult for them to kind of to jump off and out and into the into the wild blue yonder. Because that's what CMC really allows you to do. I switched my rangers and bards to spell twenty five years ago. Still prefer that one. Yeah, it, it was just too many spells in AD and D. <laughs> just my opinion in no way flex the value of it. Yeah. <laughs> of course, Big Dog. Of course, Blood Bob. Uh, or Big Dog. I wonder if we'll see a repeat of what happened in 1990 where Dungeons Dragons was in a sort of flux and a larger portion of the market was absorbed by Indian. It's very possible. It would be nice to see. Uh, the problem with that is retail stores uh, tend to drop uh, all the third party publishers down somewhat because, let's face it, if RPGs are 10% of their take, and Wizards of the Coast is 80% of that 10%. If Wizards of the Coast goes out, if D&D goes out, then that final 2% is not even worth the paperwork that you do it. You're not going to get the discounts because you're not going to order in bulk. Uh, you've got to manage two or three distributors to get all the stuff in stock, and then it sits there for too long. And then you don't have people to play it. So the, retail, the, the problem with that is the retail stores will stop carrying it. That said, that's what we saw during 4th edition. Our retail sales really declined during 4th edition, because so many stores are just closing out their RPG, you know, stance. That said, the internet has completely and totally replaced all of these networks. They're relatively antiquated now. The pandemic has just shown us how antiquated they are. Uh, people can get content extremely quickly. They're, you know, we've shipped. I can't. I can't imagine how many items that we've shipped through the post office in the past 20 years. We use the United States post office to ship everything. Um, and it's got to be tens of thousands of products shipped. I know it's far more than that. Uh, and I think we probably had 40 lost in the past 20 years. So shipping works extremely well. It's environmentally conscious. We even use peanuts that dissolve in water. So you know, all the way around, uh, the shipping just works. So stores are up against it. And if uh, it, it's going to be tough, I think, for stores to continue if D and D to continue carrying RPGs, if D and D goes down. That said, the the the, the marketplace may replace it altogether. Um, it's a hard thing. So King Coco, you may be right. That may be where we're headed. Greyhawk is too boring, <laughs> probably. No offense to the people at Wizard of the Coast, Five E is a good game for what it is. Uh, they hit their design goals, but I do not want them to ruin Greyhawk. <laughs> yeah, Greyhawk is really it's really a good contained. Oh, it's just nice. If you make an ex exhaustive rare campaign setting, it's, it's exactly. That's your spot on there. Then it's something else. It's some this huge thing that now I've got to navigate through. Greyhawk before, I didn't have to navigate it. I took it, I evolved it, and I made it my own very, very quickly. Locally, the vampire, uh, the masquerade crowd. Really? That's very cool. I remember it. Now, that's funny, too, because, you know, you mentioned the 90s. Or one of you guys did. Coulter mentioned the 90s. When I started going to Dragon Con, it was uh, 91, I think, 90 or 91, something like that. And Dragon Con was filled with, absolutely filled with LARPers and the vampire folks. And it was cool. I mean, I never got into it, but it was it was really, really, really cool to watch that whole kind of subculture develop. I really liked it. Uh, so maybe that is where we're headed. That would be kind of cool. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? It just depends on how they produce it. It just depends on how they produce it. And uh, they did that with Forgotten Realms before the edition. Nobody played it. Community runs the first show, and that might happen. Yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, it's just it, Greyhawk had, I mean, it had, it has huge appeal, I think, but it's also, it, it's a throwback. And let's face it, the world has changed. A lot of the modern gamers, younger gamers, uh, it's it's different. Now, that's not to say that that people won't adjust to something old that is new. You know what I mean? Um, so, Oh, Peter is here. I used to vampire LARP back in the 90s, played a hunter. There you go, Raven Child. Uh, saddest thing about that I ever saw, and it was just sad. I was at Dragon Con, and, you know, they were doing the LARPing, and the way they would battle one another is through paper rocks. And there was two vampires fighting, and they had me walking by. And there was this crowd of vampires, and you know, whatever, the, all the, the, the LARPers, and... One of them was in a shirt. I mean, he had the whole get up. He looked like Lestat from the movie, uh, whatever that movie was, Interview with the Vampire. He looked like, he just looked beautiful. He just looked fantastic. Costumes, makeup, hair, everything beautiful. And the guy he was fighting was just wearing literally just a white t shirt, tennis shoes, and some jeans, and, and he won. That guy won the combat. And I thought, eh, just, just, there's got to be a rule that allows costuming to, <laughs> you know. 
and I get it. Maybe street cuffs can be a vampire too, but they can't. You can't look that cool and die that easy. It just was not. It was. It was just wasn't fair. It just wasn't fair at all. But it was cool to watch. I mean, that whole sub, that whole sub genre, that game was just cool, and it was huge in Atlanta. I used to listen to a group, uh, the Changelings. Actually, the Changelings was a, a local band that that sang in Atlanta, and they did a lot of that music kind of that, you know, for that genre and stuff. Very cool stuff. Find some of it on YouTube. Actually, I uh, love the Changelings. Once you find a niche, uh, woo! Once you find your niche. No need to change. Look at Mongoose and what they're doing with the traveler. It has it. It has this crowd. Third party folks. Yeah, and Mongoose continues to, to to chug right along. They started like a year after T.O. He did. Uh, Matt over there. Uh, it's good people. They're good people. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see what what the, what's happening next. I suspect. Uh, I suspect the market conditions are changing drastically. The way people are living are changing drastically. We're we're living through it. Uh, a friend of mine works at a grocery store, and he said that before the pandemic, almost nobody used the pickup. And he said now it is 6 a.m., 12, 6 in the evening, people are there getting books, books getting food. And you know when this is over, uh, they're going to keep, people are going to keep doing that because they learn how to do it, and it's easy to do it. Uh, so the whole thing, the whole dynamic is changing uh, in ways that, Probably a little overdue, you know. There's all new ways of doing things with all kinds of technology. I'm slow to embrace technology. I'm not a huge fan of it. And it's not that I'm not a fan of technology. Uh, I just, I like to be comfortable, and I'm already comfortable, <laughs> you know, reading a book or whatever it is that I do. I actually just had my radio, I had a new radio put in a truck about two years ago. I had all kinds of, like, I don't know, stuff, and... Pandora, is that a thing? Uh, it had USB and I don't know, it had eight things that it could do, and it just kept me pissed off all the time because it's constantly. Happening. I just wanted to listen to the radio, and I kept hitting the little button, and it would have to cycle through all of the Spotify was on there. It had to cycle through all the crap to get to the radio. Uh, it wouldn't hook to the phone half the time. I punched it into the dashboard about two weeks ago, and then I just went back and got the. Uh, a replacement for the original radio that was in the truck, and it's just a radio. That's the radio. <laughs> I put it in there. I'm just I'm playing it. So I kind of I, for myself, I <laughs> kind of like things a little a little simpler. But I don't think that gamers are far from that. I really don't. Um, you look at like even console games. I don't think console games are as popular as they were just five years ago because you can do everything on the PC that you could on a console. Uh, and it's faster, and there's more equipment, and it's quicker downloads, and there's all kinds of stuff. So I think even though we we like to think that we like all of these gadgets and stuff, everybody still kind of likes things simple uh, and easy. It's just what you've mastered it and what not. And to go full circle, that's why you should play Castle and Crusade. Because <laughs> it's very simple, and it's very easy. It's not console to PC, it's physical media to digital downloads. Uh, well, there is that. But now, can't you, like on, on the Xbox, can't you get a digital download now? See, now my son is a huge, huge online gamer. Uh, <coughs> both of them are. And he will tell you about, is it PPS, PS, uh, refreshment rates on your monitors that the uh, TVs can't do and the consoles can't do. Blah, blah, blah. He's all technical crap, but he... And I'm like, what? You can see point one zero 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 two or whatever. <laughs> you can't see that fast. We are But um, this this scales aren't true. Oh, I can only imagine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I can't even imagine. I haven't bought a CD in a decade. No, five years. I don't know. I can't imagine why anyone uh, would buy any kind of thing. And that, yeah, I guess that would. Yeah, I guess that would hit consoles harder. But I think that PCs are, they've now kind of got to that point where it's easier to do, I guess. I don't know. I, I, I'm talking on my ass at this point. I don't play very many video games. And the only one I do play routinely is Grand Theft Auto 5 on the Xbox. So, <laughs> so beyond that, uh, refresh rate. Yeah, that's what he he keeps going on about, his damn monitor. <laughs> uh, I, I can't imagine the eye can even notice it. But um, and that's something to do with the whole... Oh, he plays Mountain Blade all the time, and that, that will tell you, I will say, Kothar, obviously you know uh, he loves that game, and watching him play that game, that looks like something I could get into, uh, because that's not really world building, but it sort of is, and it, it's got just 
There's some cool graphics to it. So, uh, but it's a PC game. I don't even think it's on console. Probably. Mm. Keep yawning. Let's see. I saw a video recently on YouTube where they demonstrated how even up to 120 hertz. Makes, it's yeah. He's always he's always shouting this stuff to me. Not shouting, but telling me about this stuff. And I don't always talk about it. But he's got some. He that's the only place he spends his money. Um, is on monitors and upgrading his computer equipment. And of course, what we did when he was young, we did it both my son. My daughter just wasn't interested, so she didn't, and she never got a computer. But if they wanted a computer, they had to, they had to take care of it. I wouldn't fix it for them. So when things went wrong, you know, whether it was software or virus or whatever it was, they had to fix it. So by the age of 13 or 14 or whatever, he was, he could do all of that stuff, but he was assembling his own computers, and that's what he does now. So, you know, he, he, he buys, the, the power supply or whatever he discovered about two years ago that his power supply wasn't big enough to do his graphics card and his whatever and he went and bought that and I helped him install it but he can do I'm really just kind of scanning it as if the Congress thing on his part but uh, <clears throat> yeah it's one of those things I mean, you can you can write it up and you can't do it on your console very much once you have a console you've got it then you got to get a new console depending on the question controller games and frog dog games doing stuff together that would make sense. No, well, you know, we're right now we're doing a humble bundle together. Uh, we've got a bunch of 5e stuff over there um, on their humble bundle that they're running, and it is live now. So definitely check that out. I keep forgetting that I've got my head stuck in these codexes. Uh, definitely check that out. Wait, I'm being shouted at here in a second. Wait, uh, but uh, we are we doing is something happening? We're being raided. Raiding the party. Oh, hey, <laughs> Skagit. Skagit is raiding us. Too many things are going on. But, you know, I talk to Bill at least once a week over at Frog. I love that guy. We've known each other forever. Uh, we should do some stuff together. We, I haven't... We need to do some crossovers. would be kind of cool. CNC versions of his books. You know, Sword and Wizardry versions of our books. Uh, that would be cool. I love Frog. And of course, now, Bill is in Gashmore. So, he wrote a section for Gashmore. It is badass. How's it going, Skaga? Thanks for the raid. Much appreciated. Uh, let's see. Let's... Right, Reaper, and I'm going to post an announcement about tomorrow. Okay, all right. Oh, it's 5 o'clock. We're overdue. Uh, <laughs> Bibble babble not. Uh, let me see. No, 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 dude, we are very, very good friends. Uh, we, we've been hanging out forever and a day. Like I said, we're doing Humble Bundle together now. We used to print their books for them. Uh, I, I, Bill is one of those guys. Bill Webb, he owns Star Dark Games. If Bill calls me to do something, he's one of those guys. I'll do it in a nanosecond. I absolutely love that bastard as well. And on that note, we're going to sign off. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for the raid, Skagit. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. And thank you for the follows and subs. We much appreciate it. I think we are going to be doing a raid here soon. And Reaper is where we're heading, I think. Uh, thanks for the MA stream. Really great. Thanks, Commander Pete. Much, I really enjoy this. This is, this is I'm glad you guys come by and visit because it's really a nice... Uh, it allows me to kind of <laughs> break free. From the Almighty Troll Lord that won't let me go. Um, but uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Ultra Magnus. Thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, when you, so I'm going to stop streaming here in just a minute when Chuck yells at me, uh, and then I will be out of here and I will go get Codex Egyptium off of the server so I can get back to that. And hopefully we can wind that up. But I think it might be dinner time. I think I might go eat some dinner. Uh, where are we at, Chuck? Don't forget. Uh, oh, we got World Animal tomorrow at one or at noon. World Animal tomorrow at noon, and Jim Tricks of the Trade four o'clock on Thursday, and Chuck's game on Saturday. Very cool, Skaga. Thirteen cheers. Who's off? Our trolls off, as we say around here. All right, Chuck. What are we doing? I'm suddenly hungry now that I mentioned dinner, <laughs> and I'm going to order the microphone tonight. I got the card. I've got the credit card right here. I'm going to put it in front of my keyboard. Here we go. All right. Thank you all for showing up. Very much appreciate it. We will see you next time. Ending screen.